Well, we're continuing the uh, the decline now in the stock market. As I speculated on my last podcast, I think that the uh, bear market relief rally has likely ended. You know, the Fed can only buy so much uh, with uh, its uh, QE and uh, rate cuts. And of course, there was a lot of optimism surrounding the rally that the recovery was going to be swift, right? After all, we turned it off. We can turn it on. It's not like this is a real recession. We did this to ourselves and we could just undo it. And, and I think now that kind of the, the, the fog is kind of lifting, people are starting to realize that that narrative really uh, wasn't true and that this is going to be a much deeper, much longer lasting, protracted a recession than a lot of people initially believed. And I still don't think people have come to terms with uh, with how weak the economy was before we even had the COVID-19 situation. But before I even get into the economics, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the market. You know, the Dow was down about 218 points today. We closed on the lows you know, we still had some strength in the tech stocks. The Nasdaq was slightly positive today. So you have uh, some of these uh, hope stocks uh, that people are all crowding into because they still want to be in the market. You know, they can't not be in the market. And so uh, they're just crowding in uh, to just a few names that are kind of like a lifeboat. I mean, I don't know why uh, people just don't want to look at gold stocks as an alternative uh, to more conventional stocks. You know, I was listening uh, to uh, CNBC today and they had a Kevin O'Leary, a.k.a. Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. And he was out there recommending Boeing. And he said that, you know, he had been buying Boeing and he's pretty much advising uh, CNBC viewers to go out and buy Bo Boeing. And his rationale for buying it was that the Fed and the government were never going to let it go bankrupt, that it was never going to go to zero. And so why fight the Fed? And so since the government and the Fed have indicated that they are going to do whatever it takes to save Boeing, well, then he's going to invest in Boeing because he doesn't want to fight the Fed, which, first of all, this shows you how bad this is, that people are investing in companies that maybe they wouldn't invest in but for the determination of the government to make sure the company doesn't go out of business. I mean, the government shouldn't be getting involved in the free market. I mean, if Boeing is going to fail or succeed, it should do it on its own. You shouldn't have the government trying to pick winners and losers by saying, aha, Boeing is just too big to fail. It's too important to fail or whatever they want to claim it. And so therefore, we're going to prop it up at any cost. And then capital gets sucked into Boeing that the free market would probably allocate someplace else. And so if the government is going to keep Boeing alive, what business is going to die? What, what business is going to be sacrificed to make that possible? Again, it's another example of the seen versus the unseen. If the government is going to save Boeing, we can see that Boeing is saved. We can see the jobs that are not lost. But what we don't see are the companies that fail because the resources that they would have been able to use were diverted to Boeing instead. We don't see the jobs that are lost uh, to make the jobs at Boeing possible, right? This is always the problem. And whenever the government does this and replaces its own judgment for the markets, it's wrong. And, and therefore, we have a less efficient economy and we have a lower standard of living. But, you know, if uh, Kevin O'Leary were really thinking about it, if it's the Federal Reserve that's committed to saving Boeing, how are they going to do that? Well, they're going to do that by printing money. I mean, that's all they got, right, is inflation. In fact, whenever you hear uh, these commentators talking about how the Fed is injecting liquidity into the market, right? I hear this all the time. The Fed is providing liquidity. You have to substitute creating inflation because that's really what they're doing. In fact, my father, you know, had a chapter in his book, The Biggest Con, called I think it was Ziganomics, and he called it Zigs. And he talked about how whenever uh, the government talks about creating inflation, they never use the word inflation, right? They they want to come up with all sorts of clever euphemisms 
to describe inflation, but they never want to utter uh, the word inflation, right? So uh, creating liquidity uh, is inflation. That's what it is. It's printing money, creating new money, and spending it into circulation. But that does not help the economy. It's never helped the economy. Uh, what it does do is help to sustain a bubble. In fact, I was listening to uh, Fed Vice Chair uh, Richard Clarida the other day. I think it was yesterday uh, or, or the day before. I forget. It was Monday or Tuesday. But he was talking uh, about how the Fed is going to you know, support the economy during this time of need, right? During the pandemic, while the economy is shut down, right, because our leaders are doing the right thing, we're putting the public health uh, above the economy. But as we're all sacrificing and not going to work, right, and staying at home, the Fed has got our back, right? The Fed is going to support the economy during this time of need. But how does the Fed support the economy? What can the Fed actually do, right? Just print money. That's all they could do, right? They can artificially suppress interest rates so that we can take on more debt and they can create money. They can rob people of their purchasing power through inflation. And, and allow the government to spend that stolen purchasing power in the economy. But does that help the economy? No. The Fed has no tools to support the economy. You don't support the economy by printing money. Now, the Fed could try to support the bubble. It can try to prevent the bubble from deflating or have it deflate more slowly. But that's actually hurting the real economy. Enabling the government to get bigger, spending more, by underwriting that debt, by monetizing that debt, that is actually hurting the economy. So everything the Fed is doing to sustain the bubble, uh, to enable bigger government, right? all of that is actually hurting the economy, right? So the Fed has a lot of ability to hurt the economy. There are a lot of things the Fed could do that will undermine the economy. There's nothing they can do to support the economy other than extracting themselves uh, from interfering, right? They have to undo the damage they've done. They have to allow interest rates to go up. They have to stop monetizing debt. That would help the economy only because they stopped hurting it, right? That's what they could do to help is to stop hurting. But of course, in the short run, uh, that medicine is, you know, isn't going to go down smooth. It's bitter. It's not going to taste good. And in fact, in that same interview, uh, when Cl uh, 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 Cl Clarida was talking, he said again that, you know, once this emergency is over, you know, once the coronavirus is cured or whatever, we go back to normal, then the Fed is going to withdraw, right? The Fed is going to remove all these excesses. I mean, haven't, haven't we heard that one before? Right? Isn't that the same BS line uh, that they fed us after the 2008 financial crisis, right? QE was in a temporary emergency. They were going to eliminate it or unwind it as soon as uh, the emergency was over. They weren't monetizing the debt. It was all temporary. They were going to normalize rates and shrink the balance sheet. That's what they said before. It was a lie before. I knew it was a lie before. I told everybody it, that would listen that the Fed was lying, uh, but people didn't believe me. I mean, the markets believed the Fed. They believed Bernanke. And now they're supposed to believe the Fed today? when they're trying to tell an even bigger lie that the Fed is going to take away the support when it's no longer needed, that's impossible because they are basically giving a drug addict drugs. And if you're high on drugs, you can't say, well, we're going to take away the drugs when you don't need it anymore, when the drugs are the source of the high. When you're high on drugs, you constantly need those drugs. You can't take the drugs away. And so all the Federal Reserve does when it intervenes in the way that it has and it comes in with all this cheap money, it can never take the cheap money away. Again, right, that's the monetary roach motel that I talked about. You know, in fact, they even talked about that again today on CBC. Joe, Joe Kernan uh, brought up uh, the monetary roach motel. And again, I know he thinks of me every time he says that because his you know, buddy Steve Leisman uses that analogy too. I'm the one that started it, right? I used monetary roach motel before anybody else did. When they did the first QE, when they didn't even call it QE1 because they were they thought it was the only one. I said from day one, it was a monetary roach motel. I wrote about it in commentaries. I talked about it even in my stand-up routine that I, I referenced on the last podcast, the monetary roach motel, right? I knew that. People didn't know it back then. But what Curtin said today is he said, well, if it was a monetary roach motel back then, well, then what is it now? Obviously, 
In fact, he was he had a guy on there. They were discussing gold. He had the CEO of uh, of Bear Gold on, and you know they were talking about the price of gold. And 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 of course, you know the CEO he's reluctant to really criticize anything the Fed is doing or the government is doing, but he is pointing out that they are debasing money, right? And central banks around the world are are reducing the value of their currency. They're creating inflation. And so he's pointing out that that's good for gold. He's not criticizing the economic policy. He's just pointing out uh, the benefits to gold of, of the policy. And, and so when he's talking to Kernan, Kernan said, but, but why didn't gold go up before? Right? Because, you know, gold went up to almost 2,000. He says, and all the usual suspects back then were saying it was going to go to 5,000. And by usual suspects, you know, he means me. Right. It's like my name. It's like, you know, in broadcasting, there's I don't know six or seven words that you're not allowed to say, although maybe you can say some of them now. We've kind of uh, loosened up on some of that. But there were these words that you're not allowed to say in broadcasting. They're, they're curse words. Well, you can add one more word to that list on CNBC. And that's Peter Schiff. Right. You, you can think about me, but you can't actually mention uh, my name. Uh, but but he said, you know, wh why didn't it go up to 2000 back then? Right. I mean, because we did all the QE1, QE2 are at zero. Why did gold not go to five, ten thousand back in 2011? And why should it go there now? Well, again, the difference is back in 2011, gold had just gone from under 300 to almost 2000 in 10 years without a correction. Ten year massive increase in the price of gold. So we had that. We were overdue for some kind of correction. But then again, the important fact that everybody has to remember is that the Fed was able to fool everybody into thinking that it wasn't a monetary roach motel, that they could unwind the policy, that it was temporary, that they could normalize interest rates and shrink their balance sheet. People believed that was going to happen. That is why gold had that big correction all the way down to 1,000, 1,050. It was gold discounting the normalization process, all of the rate hikes, all of the quantitative tightening was priced into gold before the Fed even started. Because remember, gold stopped its decline the minute the Fed finally raised rates for the first time. So it was a sell the rumor, buy the fact. They were selling gold for years based on the anticipation of the Fed returning to normal. And then the minute they took their first step on the road to normalcy, that's when gold bottomed and they started buying gold. Except the Fed never completed the journey, which is what I said from the beginning, that they would have to abort the attempt to normalize rates because it was impossible, that they could never shrink their balance sheet because they got the economy hooked on the drug and they could never take it away. Well, now they're doing the same thing again, right? They're giving a bigger dose of the same drug that they couldn't get the economy off before. Remember, they started cutting rates. They ended QT and went back to QE before anybody ever heard of COVID-19 or coronavirus. Uh, so the air was already coming out of the bubble. But now they're giving us even more of the same drug that we were just high on. And now Clarita is saying the same thing, right? Oh, it's, we're gonna re it's only temporary. As soon as it's no longer needed, we're going to take it away. Well, it's always needed. I mean, if you want to keep the bubble going, right? If you want to let the bubble pop, if you want to let the whole house of cards collapse, sure, you can remove the policy. But if you're determined to keeping the bubble going, which is what the Fed is, uh, then you can never stop. But the difference is, and why I think gold is going to keep going up now, is no one is going to believe the Fed this time. I mean, they can't fool anybody, right? Fool me once, shame on, uh, 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 on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The market's not going to get fooled again by the exact same lie, especially when it's so much more preposterous now. Because the debt is so much bigger, the size of the monetary stimulus is so much larger. We have a much bigger drug habit than we ever had. And if we couldn't kick the last drug habit, how are we going to kick this one? And in fact, again, as I was talking about the markets, look at the financials, right? Because the financials have been particularly weak during this entire uh, rally, right? This 30, whatever, 30, 35% rally off the lows. The financials have been very weak. Look at Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is now almost back down to its March low. The March low is 25.10. We closed at 25.61, right? We're almost there. We'll probably could take out the load tomorrow. The stock is down better than 50% uh, from where it was, you know, pre-COVID. 
Uh, but it's not just that. All these banks are weak. And look at a stock like GE, which has a financial aspect to it. It's almost at a new low. The March low in GE was 590. We closed at 598. We're eight cents a share off the low. GE had a 52 week high of 13 and change. And if you go back a few years ago, it was a $30 stock. It's $5.98. But the fact that the financials are so weak shows you how weak the economy is and that this rally is not real because this is a financial bubble. And so the, 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 the financial stocks, the banks, this is the litmus test. These are the canaries in the coal mine and, and they're dropping dead. And so you got to realize that this rally isn't real. What people should be buying, again, is these gold stocks, right? The gold stocks actually have great looking bottoms. Gold has a beautiful uh, chart pattern. Even Kernan had to point that out. Now, looking at the chart, he thinks, well, it's going to go to 2,000, 3,000. Yes, it's going a lot higher. It's built a fantastic base. These gold stocks are very, very cheap. You know, I know there's some big money. I mean, look at hedge fund manager uh, Paul Singer. He was out, you know, the other day uh, uh, talking about how gold was going to move up by multiples of its current price, said it was the most undervalued asset uh, in the world. And, you know, he's almost right. Maybe silver would be the most undervalued and gold would come in second place. Uh, but it's the same thing. It's these monetary metals because you've had maximum um, uh, uh, trust and confidence in central banks. And that trust and confidence is about to be lost. And when people trust central banks, they'll hold on to their fiat money. But when that trust goes, then they're going to take refuge in real money which is gold, gold and silver. And so these prices are going to go up dramatically. And so if you don't want to fight the Fed, don't buy Boeing. That's not the way not to fight the Fed. The way not to fight the Fed is to own gold, is to own mining stocks, because then you're with the Fed. Then you're betting on the Fed continuing to repeat the mistakes of the past in the future, which I think is a reasonable bet to make. Now, also, we got a lot of economic data that came out this week. And again, almost all of it worse than expected. Uh, and it was expected to be bad, right? I mean, everybody knows the news is going to be bad. So it's almost, again, a non-event. But we got the PMI service sector index uh, for April. They were looking for 27. I mean, that is a really low number, 27, down from a previous 39.8 uh, in, in March, which was a really low number. And we got 26.7. We got even lower than what they expected. And the PMI composite also, they were looking for 27.4. We got 27.0. So as low as they were expecting, it came in even lower. Trade deficit, again, worse than expected. We're not getting any narrowing of the trade deficit during this economic contraction. They were looking for a $44 billion uh, deficit in March. We're, no, we're, we're not even at April yet. Uh, and this would have followed the $39.8 billion deficit in February. And instead, we widened a little bit more to $44.4 billion. So more trade deficits uh, indicative of weaker economic of a weaker economy. Look at factory orders. These are March, not even April yet. These are the March factory orders. Uh, the prior month was uh, down 0.1. It was originally reported unchanged, but they were looking for down nine and a half. And as bad as that number is, down nine and a half, we actually came in worse, down 10.3. And that's March. Wait to see what happens to the April number. And of course, the worst number of all is the one we got this morning on the ADP jobs number. These are private sector jobs. This is the precursor to the big report we get from the government, the non-farm payroll report that's coming out on Friday. And the consensus was for a loss of 20 million jobs in one month. Now, how do you beat that kind of consensus. How do you come in with a worse number than 20 million? Well, we did. <laughs> we came out with 20,236,000 jobs lost. And in fact, they took uh, the March number and they revised it lower from minus 27,000 to minus 149,000. So we ended up with about 450,000 extra jobs lost above what they believed was going to happen, which normally, I mean, that's a big number to miss by. 400,000 uh, jobs, but against 20 million, I guess it's just almost like a rounding error because so many Americans have lost their jobs. But despite all these job losses, 
and more job losses that are coming, right? You still have so many forecasters that are bullish, not only on the market, but they're bullish on the economy. I mean, what has to happen for some of these perma bulls right, to ever become bearish? I mean, it's almost impossible to envision a scenario where these guys are like, yeah, I think we should sell U.S. stocks. I think this is going to be a really long recession. I mean, these guys are grasping at straws. There was this one guy I was watching. I forget who he was. I don't remember his name. Um, but he was saying that he expected the consumer to hang in there and stay strong, right? Even throughout the whole recession, they, he was confident that the consumer was going to be strong. Even And with all this unemployment, right, still confident that the consumer was going to spend as much as he was spending before. You know, as soon as the, the lockdown is over, I mean, they're just going to be out there spending. And one of the reasons that he was so confident that the consumers were going to spend with such reckless abandon as they always have was he pointed out that a lot of people, a lot of workers are making more money collecting unemployment benefits than they were making when they were working, which is a true statement, unfortunately, which is why so many people are going to stay unemployed that might have got back to work. They're not going to go back to work because they make more money not working. And so according to this guy, this is good for the economy because now they have these higher paychecks, right? Their unemployment checks. And so they'll go out and spend even more money because they're making more money. And, and first of all, you know, if the government could just give people money not to work, I mean, why wait for the COVID-19? Just do it all the time. If it's so great, just do it. Uh, but what this guy is missing, apart from that, that aspect of it, but why would you believe that the consumer is going to take all of these unemployment benefits and just spend it all, right? I mean, you got to think that some of the American consumers are basically going to get scared straight out of this experience, right? You got people who have lost their jobs and a lot of these people, they have no idea if they're going to get their jobs back. I mean, because all the jobs aren't going to come back. Yes, some of them are going to come back, but a lot of them are not going to come back. And the enhanced benefits are temporary. They don't go on forever. I think it's four months. Yes, they might extend it, but you don't know that for sure. And if they extend it, I mean, how long are they going to do it? So put yourself in the place of somebody who's unemployed. They just lost their job. They have no idea when they're going to get another job. Meanwhile, they're struggling with debt. They got credit card debt. They got, you know, auto loans. They can barely pay their rent if they can even pay their rent. And now they're getting some extra money in unemployment benefits. Are they just going to rush, you know, to Amazon and just buy more stuff that they really can't afford? when they already have all this debt from buying stuff in the past that they couldn't afford and that they shouldn't have bought, but they bought anyway? No. What are people going to do with their unemployment money, at least the money that they don't spend at the supermarket, you know, because prices are going up over there or they don't spend, you know, for other supplies they're stocking up on? They're going to put that money in their pocket. They're going to save it, right? They need to save some money. I mean, I doubt they'll pay down their credit card debt. I mean, some might. But some might figure, I don't know what you want to pay up my credit card debt. I'll just not pay my credit card debt. And I'll just take this unemployment money and I'll put it in my bank account because I might need it because the unemployment benefits might run out. They may not extend it. Who knows what I'm going to get a job? Do you really think unemployed people living off of unemployment checks are going to just spend that money as if they still had jobs and they were still confident that they were going to have a job in the future and that the money was going to keep coming? No, they're not going to bet on this gravy train lasting forever. So the fact that you've got analysts that are excited about consumers spending their enhanced unemployment benefits, and so that's a reason to be optimistic, that shows you how ridiculous, how little thought actually goes in uh, to a lot of these analysts' assessment of the economy, right? People are going to save that money. They're already broke. They're loaded up with debt and they don't have jobs. I mean, yes, they'll spend what they need to spend to survive, but the rest they're going to save, which is the smart thing to do. So businesses that are dependent on consumer spending are in a lot of trouble. And we know that we got a lot of companies that came out uh, warning about losses in the last couple of days. You know, Disney was out. In fact, the stock was actually up on the day. Let me see if it finished positive. You know, you've. Uh, now it was down 18 cents, but it should be down a lot more. I mean, given the, the, the losses, 
Uh, but think about this. I mean, Disney was talking about their plans to reopen because, you know, Disney's getting clobbered, right? Their theme parks are closed, right? So they're not getting any rev revenue from Disney World. They have these cruises, these Disney cruises. Those aren't operating. They produce movies, which the theaters, nobody's going to the movies. So you don't have the box office, right? Yes, they have Disney Plus. So they have that streaming service, but that's all they got. I mean, that's it. They, I mean, the whole business can't just be based on the streaming service. Uh, so they're in a lot of trouble, right? And the stock was obviously very high, uh, you know, before this whole thing happened. But think about what they're talking about. So they, they, they kind of were laying out a plan to reopen uh, the theme parks, right? And the first one they're going to reopen is uh, Shanghai, Disneyland Shanghai. And they're going to do it. They're going to limit the number of attendees to maybe a half of capacity or a third of capacity. Uh, although I don't actually think they have to limit capacity because I don't think a lot of people are going to want to go, right? I don't think they're going to have to worry about stopping people from going and limiting attendance. I think the attendees are going to limit themselves by not showing up because why would you want to go? Because first of all, everyone's going to have to wear a mask. Who the hell wants to spend a day at Disneyland wearing a mask? I mean, they didn't talk about when they were going to open, you know, Disney World, Florida or California, but this would be a similar plan. Look, I'm a big fan of Disney. I mean, I think they put on a great show. Uh, the kids love it. Uh, I enjoy being there. I like taking my kids. You know, I was just at Disney World. I mentioned it on a podcast uh, uh, earlier this year. We were there. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. But would I want to go wearing a mask all day? Hell no. I mean, you spend like 10, 12 hours in the park and it's hot in South Florida or even in Southern California. Who wants a mask on your face in a hot day? You want to stand on those lines wearing a mask? I don't want to do that. Plus, they said that everybody is going to have to have their temperature taken to get into the park. Now, I don't know how you know much time that's going to waste having to have your temperature taken. I don't know how quick, maybe it's fast, uh, but but even then, I mean, what if you have a fever? I mean, a slight fever. I don't even know what counts. I mean, could you imagine you get a family, right? Maybe a husband and wife, two or three kids, and they, they they get on a plane and they wear their masks on the plane and, you know, all spaced out, whatever it is. And they go down to Disney and they check into this hotel. And then in the morning, they schlep all the kids over to the Magic Kingdom and they wait on this long line. And all of a sudden, you know, little Johnny has got 99 temperature. Sorry, you can't go in the park. Can you imagine that? After all that, you can't go in the park. And of course, you got one kid that can't go in the park. Well, which parent is going to stay back in the hotel? Because you can't just leave a little kid by himself or herself. So one of the parents is going to have to spend the whole day in the hotel room. And who the hell wants to tell a kid that? Can you imagine you bring your kid to Disneyland? I mean, you tease them like that, right? Yeah. Oh, you get them all excited. We're going to Disney World. And, and then you get there and you got to tell them, sorry, you can't go because you got a fever. Who would want to take that kind of chance? And pluck, what about keeping masks on kids? I said, I don't want to wear a mask myself. How do you keep a mask on a five-year-old or a six-year-old? They're not going to want to wear a mask. So this whole thing is complete nonsense. And, you know, you can't you can't go up and hug the characters, right? The little kids, you know, when you're in Disney World, you want to go and you want to hug Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. He's got, you know, you got to keep your distance. You can't shake their hand. You can't give them a hug. Why would anybody want to go? I mean, it's not like Disney is cheap. It's pretty expensive, right? For middle class, upper middle class, those tickets ain't cheap. And then you got to pay for the airfare. And then you got to pay for the hotel. Who the hell is going to want to go, right? Even if it's not going to be as crowded as normal, you're still not going to want to go because your experience is not going to be ideal. And so you know what? I'll wait. I'll wait a year. I'll wait two years. You know, we'll go then, right? I'm not going to spend money to go to Disneyland under these less than ideal conditions. Right. So they're not I mean, it's not going to work. This is all fantasy that they think this is going to work. It's it's not. And the same problem is going to happen with all sorts of businesses that think, well, we're just going to reopen with these conditions and it's going to work. It's not. I mean, think about restaurants. Right. Are people going to want to go out to restaurants? Not really. I mean, a you got to wear a mask. You know, and the, the 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 restaurants in order to open, right? They have to have all these restrictions. In fact, I mentioned this on the show that I think 
the government is probably going to come out with some type of protocol, right? Some kind of um, standard operating uh, procedure that businesses can follow. And if they follow it, then maybe they'll, you know, be insulated from liability, right? So if you do all the protocol that we set up, right, to protect your employees and to protect your customers, if you follow all this, these guidelines, then you can't be sued, right? So if somebody gets, uh, you know, COVID-19, you know, one of your workers or one of your customers, if you followed to the letter, everything we say you need to do, then you won't be sued. So, right. Well, first of all, that means all the businesses are going to have to do this, right? Otherwise it's too risky. They're going to get sued. And believe me, even if you follow all the rules, you'll still get sued because there'll be some lawyer that'll try to see, did you dot every I, did you cross every T and, you know, just the, the mere getting the shakedown, even if you just settle it, even if you did cross all your T's and dot all your I's, you still might have to pay off a lawyer because you can't afford uh, to defend yourself, which is, a, you know, another added cost. But you take uh, a restaurant and if they have to operate with all these restrictions, you know, where they can, they have to limit the number of people who can be in the restaurant to maybe 50% of capacity. How are they going to make ends meet? It's not like these restaurants were killing it when they were full. It, it's a low margin business. They're not going to survive if they have to have half uh, the restaurant open, right? If they can't, you know, get the economies of scale that they need to cover their fixed costs, like their rent, they can't tell their landlord, hey, you know, I'm only going to have uh, half the people. And that's if they're lucky. They might they might only get 25%. Just because they officially limit it to half, the, the, you think they're going to get half the people that are going to come back? Probably not. Uh, so how are they going to get by? Yeah, they maybe they don't have to bring back all their waiters or all the bus boys or all the, you know, the dishwasher, but they got to bring back some of them. They're not going to be able to make it. And to the extent that they are serving, what's going to have to happen to prices, right? If restaurants have fewer customers, but they still have all this overhead, those customers are going to have to cover that overhead. So they're going to have to dramatically increase the cost of the meal. So if you want to go out to a restaurant under non-ideal conditions, you're going to be paying through the nose. The cost of going to a restaurant is going to go way up, which that will also discourage people from going. The problem is a lot of these restaurants, based on how high they're going to have to raise their menu prices in order to get by with a few smaller customers, fewer customers, that's going to turn off the customers. The customers aren't going to want to pay the price high enough to keep the restaurant afloat. So the restaurant is going to fail. Look, the same thing is going to happen with all these industries. What about airlines, right? When they figure out how you can fly in a plane where they, you know, they just don't let allow as many passengers to cram into coach, right, as they've been doing. Well, what do they have to do? They have to raise prices for the people who do buy tickets because you still have to fly that plane. You still have the same crew. You're still using the fuel. Doesn't matter if the flight is one third uh, full, you still got to fuel it up. You got to pay for the flight attendants. You got to pay for the pilot, the co-pilot. You got to pay all the other costs overhead of uh, running the airports and the airline. But now you have to spread those costs under a smaller pool of customers. So those customers are going to have to pay much, much higher prices in order to fly. So all throughout the service industry, right? The movies, if the movie theaters are going to have to limit the number of people who can go in the theater to watch the movie, what do they have to do? They have to raise the prices so that the people who do decide to go to a movie theater, they're going to have to pay a lot more money in order to keep that theater in business because they can't rely on all the other uh, customers because they're not going to be there, either because they're not allowed to be there because the, the, the theater owner is trying to you know, follow these protocols so he doesn't get sued, or people just don't want to go. What the hell? I'll just stay at home and I'll watch on my big screen. Why do I need to go out and risk uh, 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 getting a, a virus? And I don't want to sit through a three out, two hour movie wearing a mask anyway. How am I supposed to eat my popcorn if I got a mask on? I mean, all of these experiences. And again, what people just don't seem to get is these industries, these service sector industries were already in trouble before coronavirus. Look at all these bankruptcies. You know, today, Lord and Taylor, they just announced they're not just going bankrupt. They're going out of business. So they're going to have a big going out of business sale. And this is going to be commonplace. In fact, I think they want to keep the stores open long enough so they can sell the merchandise, you know, from the actual store instead of just online. 
But look, in the age of Amazon, all of these retailers were already in trouble, right? This is just another nail in that coffin. But you have all these retail outlets that have closed down, right? They're not going to reopen. I mean, this is it. This was the final straw. I mean, a small fraction of these stores that closed down are going to reopen because they were going to, you know, close down anyway in this recession it was going to happen. People forget that. They just assumed that everything was would have been fine if we didn't, you know, get the coronavirus. No, it wouldn't have been. We were going to have a recession anyway. These, these stores were living on borrowed time. Restaurants too. We have too many restaurants, uh, too many stores because the consumers broke. Where were the consumers getting the money to go to these restaurants, to, to take vacations, to stay in hotels? To, they were borrowing it. Well, now the whole uh, thing has collapsed. And now we've had this wake-up call where, where people realize, wait a minute, I lose my paycheck. I'm broke. I can't pay my rent. Hello, I got to stop living beyond my means. I got to start saving. So this whole thing is changing. The bubble is uh, deflating. And the other thing that people don't even get, right, is normally, and I, I talked about this for years, if we had had a real economic recovery, right, we would be in much better shape to handle this recession. See, in a normal recovery, right, what would happen is consumers would be paying back the debts that they incurred during the preceding recession, right? Because during the recession, you lose your job and now you have to dip into your rainy day fund, right? You have to raid your savings. You don't have a job. So I got to draw down my savings. Maybe I pull some money out of my retirement account. Maybe I run up some credit card bills, right? Because I got to get through the tough times. So I, I use my rainy day fund because now it's raining. Well, when you get a real recovery where people get real jobs again, productive, good paying jobs, what do they do? Well, now I can pay back the money I borrowed when times were bad. I can replenish my savings. I can put the money back into my 401k that I borrowed, right? I can I can build myself up again. So I have a cushion to withstand the next downturn. The same thing with corporations. Corporations should be paying down debt. Maybe times were bad, right? There was a recession, so their customers weren't spending. And so... Uh, they had to dip into their savings or maybe borrow some money to get through a lean time. Well, now all of a sudden the economy is booming. People are working, they're productive and they're spending their earnings, right? Not what they borrowed, but what they earned, right? Well, now all of a sudden the companies can pay back the money they borrowed, right? They could, they could repair their balance sheets, use the recovery, right? To get in good shape. Same thing with governments. What happens with governments during a recession? Oh, the deficits really shoot up. Because now people aren't paying as much in taxes because they've lost their jobs. Uh, so the government tax revenues go down. But now more people are on welfare, unemployment, food stamps, and things like that. And then you have stimulus plans. And so the government runs these bigger deficits when times are bad, supposedly, you know, to tide us over until times are good again. Or maybe they think it helps the times uh, get good. But now all of a sudden you have a real recovery, right? What is the government supposed to do? Well, now it's got more tax revenue coming in. And it's not spending as much on safety programs. So the deficits are supposed to come down when times are good. So you have that room. And what does the Fed normally do? Well, when times were bad, the Fed cuts rates. But then when the recovery starts, the Fed really starts raising rates up again. So then by the time we have another recession, the Fed has a long way to go to cut rates to try to supposedly ease the pain or stimulate the economy. But this is a completely different situation than we've ever faced in the past because, A, the Fed never normalized interest rates. So interest rates were barely above zero when the recession began, right? I mean, the, the Fed just went to zero in one swoop, right? Because they had cut them three times to one and a half, right, before the recession started. Then as soon as the recession started, they went from one and a half to zero. That was it. One rate cut. That's all they had. One and done. And they were back at zero. And what about the debt? I mean, we had massive deficits. We had a trillion dollar deficit in the fiscal year before the recession began. So we're starting with massive debt. What about corporations? They're levered to the max. They didn't pay down any debt during this phony expansion. They incurred more debt. 
What about the consumer? The consumer's never been in such bad shape. During this whole phony recovery, nobody recovered. The consumers, the American households are in more debt now than they were 10 years ago before the so-called recovery started. So how is there a recovery if we haven't recovered from anything? We had a debt crisis. We had too much debt in 2008. Did we recover from that? No, we have more debt than ever before. If we had a real recovery, we would have paid that debt down, right? We would have rebuilt our savings. That's what I wanted from the beginning. But the Fed prevented that from happening with its stimulus and its QE, exactly what it's doing again. So people just don't get how vulnerable the economy was to the next recession, regardless of what caused it. See, it doesn't matter you know, what caused the recession. All that matters is that the recession happens. And see, once it happens, then it takes on a life of its own. Then you, all these problems are exposed. Now, the fact that this recession is being kicked off by this coronavirus and all of this, you know, quarantining and social distancing and mandated closings, this just means that the recession that was going to start anyway is just worse. Yes, this makes it worse than it otherwise would have been. It was going to be really bad anyway. And so now something that would have been really bad anyway is just a whole lot worse. But because you have so many people that were still fooled, that still thinks, thought that the economy was real, like Trump. I watched another interview. I was on Fox News. I think it was, was it Sunday or whatever? I think it was Sunday night. But the president, he spoke in front of the Lincoln Memorial uh, with a couple of, you know, Fox News reporters. Brett Baer, I think, was one of them. Um, but one of the things he said is he said, you know, before this happened, we had in America the greatest economy in the history of the world, right? We had this fantastic economy, the greatest economy ever. And then he said, and it's a fact. And nobody can dispute that. It's just an undeniable fact that we had the greatest economy ever. And of course, the guys from Fox News, they're not going to dispute the president, right? They just let him get away with this ridiculous claim that we had the greatest economy in the history of the world, right? Before the coronavirus. And then he said, and then they told me, this is Trump, we got to turn it off. And I'm like, what? I got to turn this great economy off like it's some kind of faucet, right? We had this booming economy, the greatest economy ever. And now I got to turn it off. And I didn't want to do it because it was so great. And I did it. But then he's acting as if he could turn it right back on. He could just flip the switch and we're just going to boom again. But we were never booming before. It was a gigantic debt bubble. And now all we're doing is just taking debt off the charts, the amount of money that we're printing. In fact, I want to check the uh, the national debt clock to see if we've hit uh, 25 trillion yet. national debt. You know, I go, you go, you could go look at it on the internet, the U.S. national debt clock. But last I checked, it wasn't quite there. Up, oh, we're there. 20, we went, we went through it today. It's 25 trillion and 39 billion, 25 trillion national debt, right? We were just yesterday, I looked at it. It was, it was just under 24 and a half trillion. So we've added, based on this, we've added about another hundred billion to the national debt since the last time I looked at this clock yesterday, yesterday, 25 trillion dollars in debt. The crazy thing is we're going to go to 50 trillion. We're going to double this debt. How many more years? Five, six, seven. I don't know. Something like that. But that's how quickly we're going to go from 25 trillion to 50 trillion dollars. You know, the debt right now is 117% of GDP, but that's just the federal debt. If you add the state and municipal debt, because they're all taxing the same tax base, right? Because a lot of countries don't have these local debts. You got to count the all the government debt, not just the federal debt. So if you add the state and local debt, total government debt is 132% of GDP. And what's about to happen to GDP? It's about to implode. GDP is going to collapse just as the debt is exploding. So we're going to be you know, surging. We're going to get close to 200% of debt to GDP when you take all levels of government. I mean, there's no way to sustain that. And again, that's just the funded debt. That's the money the government has actually borrowed. That's not all the debt that the U.S. government has committed to pay, right? Social Security, Medicare, Obamacare, guaranteed loans, uh, pensions, bank accounts, pen, you know, uh, pensions. There's all sorts of contingency liabilities that are $100 trillion or $200 trillion, some crazy number.
So the, the reality of this situation is the economy is in much worse shape than everybody believes. And it's just the nature of the, the virus, right, it is creating this false sense of optimism, even though, you know, the virus itself, and we still have no idea how long this thing is going to be here. And, you know, we don't even know, are we going to be able to get the all clear uh, this month, next month, the month after that? I don't know. Is there going to be a second wave? Nobody knows, right? Who knows? When they've already established this precedent of shutting everything down. This is now a huge risk that every businessman has to shoulder that didn't even exist before, as if it wasn't hard enough to be an entrepreneur and deal with all the regulations and deal with the taxation and deal with the minimum wage. Now you got to deal with this. You got to worry about, you know, the shutdowns or people just not wanting to go to your restaurant or your business. And you got to worry about your employees suing you or your customers suing you for more reasons than they could have sued you before, as if we weren't, you know, a too litigious before a COVID-19. I mean, now we're going to be even more litigious. And we had this economy like no other economy in the world that was all a debt-based consumer-driven economy. But again, it's not the consumers that are in the driver's seat. It's the producers, the producers in China, the producers in Japan, the producers all over the world that are making the stuff that we're buying and who are lending us the money to buy it. All the people who are saving what we are borrowing, right? It takes two to tango. Somebody can't borrow unless somebody else lends. And you can't lend if you don't save. So if we're a nation of debtors, it's only possible because the world is full of savers. If we are driven by consumers, it's just because the rest of the world is enabling it by doing the production that we're not doing. And this whole house of cards is falling apart. And as I've been saying, people are not focusing on the bubble. They are distracted by this big, gigantic pin that pricked it. And they don't realize that it's a pin and that it pricked the bubble. They think we had a viable economy and this is just a problem that we have to deal with. Yes, it's a problem, but it's not a problem in a healthy economy. It's a problem in a very sick economy. And the economy is a lot sicker than the virus. And that's what we have to be concerned about. Far more uh, than COVID-19 is the underlying illness that Fed policy is only exacerbating and that government fiscal policy is only exacerbating. And just, you know, what Clarita said, you know, we're going to we're going to stop doing this when the economy no longer needs it. Well, because they're doing it, the more the Fed, the more the government intervenes and you have this Federal Reserve is actually egging on Congress. They're begging the government to spend more money, to use their fiscal tools. Hey, borrow and spend whatever you want. We got your back. We're going to print an unlimited amount of money. So go to town. Don't worry about the deficits. We got you. We're going to print all the money. So, I mean, it's like waving a, a red flag at a bull. I mean, they've got carte blanche now. Why, why would they not spend, right? It could, nobody's paying for this. No taxes have to be raised. Nobody realized that the inflation tax is going to hit everybody much harder uh, than would a legitimate tax. But when you have all these policies, these policies are undermining the economy. They're not supporting the economy. They're preventing the economy from recovering. And so the more we have this fiscal monetary policy, the weaker the economy actually gets, the more dependent on that policy it becomes to survive, right? It becomes a zombie economy that needs this government support, but it's not real. And it's happening at a time that is very, very dangerous. We're six months now away from the election. And people haven't even started to factor in what happens when Trump loses, what happens when he hands the baton to Joe Biden, or maybe if the Democrats are smart, uh, somebody else other than Biden, they kick him out for uh, the sexual harassment or use that as an excuse. But whatever, you know, Hillary Clinton now uh, is uh, the, is rising in, uh, in, in, the, in the betting polls as far as I think she's maybe 10, 11 percent probability now that she'll be the nominee. Uh, so it's not Biden doesn't have a lock on it. Um, but I, I think even if it is Biden, Biden's going to win. Uh, but the markets are not even discounting what that means when you pass the baton from a socialist Republican to a socialist Democrat, when you have already got all the Republicans in Congress, right. Who have now signed on to socialism that we need all this government. We need all these bailouts. You know, they're the one thing they're not signing on to yet 
is, you know, bailing out the individual states, right? You have some Republicans that are trying to draw a line in the sand, you know, when it comes to bailing out particular state governments, because a lot of these state governments that are in the most trouble, of course, are um, blue states. They're, 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 they're run by, by Democrats. You know, you had Mayor de Blasio in, uh, in Manhattan, uh, Mayor of New York. He was basically saying, you know, Trump is a mean guy. You know, how could he turn his back on, on New York City? You know, we need help. First of all, it's like, like, like this is Trump's money, right? It's not about Trump being mean. It's not his money. Anybody can spend somebody else's money. It's not about like Trump has got this pile of money. The federal government just has this pile of money and they're just being stingy and they don't want to share it with New York, right? You know, to hell with New York. The idea is the government has to tax the people for the money, right? I mean, it's the same tax base, right? So if the federal government wants to get money, it has to take it from the people. Even if the Fed prints it, it still takes it from the people because it's taking purchasing power from the people. We don't get government for free if we pay for it by the Fed. So the people of the United States have to pay for all government spending one way or another. And so if the people in Manhattan, in New York City, if New York City is in trouble, then why doesn't the mayor raise taxes on New Yorkers? Why doesn't the governor, why doesn't Andrew Cuomo raise taxes in New York State to help New York City? Right, because it's the same taxpayers. If a city is in trouble, the people in that city should be taxed uh, to deal with it, or the people in that state. Why should people in Arizona have to be taxed to pay for people in New York? Let the people in Arizona be taxed to pay for the people in Arizona. That's why we have separate states. That's why we don't just have one gigantic government. We have individual states for a reason. They're supposed to be somewhat autonomous. They're supposed to take care of their own. The federal government is supposed to protect us all from invasion. The federal government is supposed to be involved with external affairs. The states are supposed to handle their own affairs. So if New York has a problem, the New Yorkers can deal with it. You know, there's a lot of very rich people that live in New York, right? The per capita income of New York state is one of the highest in the country. You got plenty of billionaires and millionaires in New York. Why can't New York City and New York state tax those billionaires themselves? Why do they have to beg uh, Donald Trump to do it for them and act like, well, if Donald Trump doesn't doesn't bail us out with federal money by taxing everybody, we can't tax our own citizens? No. But of course, they don't want to do that. They don't want to vote to raise taxes on New Yorkers. So they want the government to spend money in a way that doesn't hurt them politically. Look, if the money is necessary, then you raise it, right? If the government is in trouble because they don't have enough revenue, then you raise taxes. And if you can't do that politically, then cut spending. But what these Democratic governors want and these mayors is they want the government to give them a free pass so that they don't have to cut any spending and they don't have to raise any taxes. Let the federal government raise the taxes, except they're not going to raise taxes legitimately. They're going to have the Federal Reserve just print money and they're going to create massive inflation. But that's what's happening. But whatever resistance the Republicans are putting up to this plan is going to go away once the Republicans no longer have the Senate which is probably going to happen. So the markets haven't even digested this massive shift to the left uh, that we are experiencing. And, you know, the COVID-19 is providing a backdrop uh, to enable the government to do things, usurp power uh, that it probably never could have done. And it also is creating a scapegoat so that the government will be better able to blame the problems on external factors that we need government to save us from. I mean, if it wasn't for coronavirus, maybe more people would have realized that it was the government that did this. It was the Federal Reserve. It was bad monetary and fiscal policy. But now everybody is going to blame it on the boogeyman of uh, COVID-19. And then the government is going to be what we need to keep us safe. And in order to do that, we're going to surrender all sorts of liberties uh, and our economic freedoms are going to collapse along with it. So people haven't put this together yet. Right now, it's kind of like the lull, but you know, uh, before the storm, maybe we're in the eye of a hurricane or whatever it is. But people still have a window of opportunity. Sell U.S. stocks into this rally. You know, they're still we're still well off the lows. We're very close to the highs. Get rid of U.S. stocks. Get rid of U.S. bonds. Get rid of U.S. dollars and get into these overseas assets before the bottom drops out of the dollar. Buy your gold. Buy your silver. You know, shiftgold.com. Talk to my my brokers. I'm glad. You know, a lot of people. We're getting a lot of new interest now. A lot of people opening up accounts, adding to their accounts. So this is great. I'm glad people are are taking my advice and moving while they can.
I don't know how long this escape window is going to be open. Uh, you know, I keep expecting the price of gold to just take off any day. And one day it's going to. But before it happens, get your gold and silver, get into your gold stocks. You know, you have some smart people, some very, very smart, wealthy people have begun to figure it out. I mean, they don't know it all yet. I mean, they still don't realize how bad it's going to be, but they know the price of gold is going up. They know gold stocks are going up. They, they understand the inflation. They just don't know exactly how bad it's going to be. Because I remember, you know, when we were doing the subprime short, I remember when I first uh, heard about these, the, the, the mortgages, See, the guy that told me about it didn't even realize how bad it was going to be once the housing bubble popped and these mortgages became worthless. And I think a lot of the people who understood the dynamics of the trade, right, didn't really even appreciate how the, the impact it was going to have on the economy and how bad the crisis was going to be once the bubble popped because they, they didn't get the whole picture. They got enough of it uh, to understand that trade, but they didn't have understanding of the broader ramifications. Now, maybe some did, but I know a lot of them didn't. And so I think a lot of the people now that are just starting to buy gold, yes, they've got part of it, but they still don't appreciate just how bad it's going to be. Eventually, they will. And eventually, more and more people are going to discover what some of these shrewder investors have already figured out. Right. So it's not just me now. I'm not the only one in these gold stocks. I'm not the only one uh, positioning for stagflation, inflation. More people are seeing it, but our numbers are still in the minority. But once this, the size of this minority grows and eventually it'll be the majority, I mean, then it's much too late for you to reposition your portfolio. Anyway, that's it for today. I'm going to do the next podcast on Friday uh, in the afternoon after we get the non-farm payroll number, and we'll see if the market reacts at all uh, to that number and just how much worse than expectations uh, that number is. I think they're looking for 21 million uh, jobs to be lost for the month. Anyway, bye for now.